So first, first thing I got to say is, Ed, thank you very much for uh, um, agreeing to do this with me. I, I, I appreciate that. And I think it, uh, it'll be an interesting conversation. You know? So thank you very much. Yeah, cool. I just saw as well. Have you got a little uh, baby odor in the background there? Uh, I, of course I do. I have, I, have a, <laughs> I have a Grogu there, man. You know? Oh, yeah, of course. We don't call it Baby Yoda anymore. What did you think of The, the Mandalorian? Well, so here's the thing. I, um, I, I haven't watched all of it yet. Uh, just, you know, because as I said to you before, I'm super busy. Um, but, um, you know, I, I thought it was, it was fun. It's a little more lighthearted. Um, and okay. I, I, I grew up like I'm, I'm older than you. And I, I grew up watching Star Wars from the time I was like, you know, nine years old or something like that so um i think this has been a fantastic journey and and anytime they have something star wars i love i love to support it so you know i i liked it it um a little bit hokey and you know it could be a little bit more serious but you know i liked it and yourself all uh, right i made i it blew me away i absolutely loved it it kind of reinvigorated my love of star wars i kind of lost it a bit in the latest trilogy um but yeah, just I thought Mandalorian was was uh, blew me away. But if you haven't seen the last few episodes, mate, whew, you're in for a treat. You are in All for right. a treat. Good, good, good. Well, it gives me something to look forward to. So, <laughs> uh, I, I'm definitely excited about that. So listen, Ed, Ed um, for people who don't know who you are, um, tell them who is Ed Hope and what do you do on a day to day basis, my friend? Well, this is it. So I am a junior doctor in the UK, which a lot of people, every time I say junior doctor online, people are like, what the hell is a junior doctor? So it's basically any doctor that's finished med school, but isn't a consultant or a family medicine doctor. So it's a huge, broad, broad term. And the reason why I use that term is because you know, I'm going to be a junior doctor for a very long time. So it kind of suits <laughs> the kind of simple message of just saying the same thing over and over again. And I'm currently working in the emergency department. And really for the last few years, I've been working as a teaching fellow, which basically means that I've been teaching medical students on their clinical placements. So half the time I'd look after medical students and half the time I'd work just, you know, normally seeing patients as, uh, as an ED doctor. And really off the back of that, um, I started creating YouTube videos and, you know, originally they were quite <laughs> very medical education, very traditional, preachy, let's talk about medicine. And then eventually kind of, you know, that kind of stripped away a bit. And I went a lot more, yeah, a bit more fun, a bit more lighthearted, kind of accessible, entertaining view on medicine. And that's kind of where I am at the moment, really. Okay, so now you, you said that it, it started, um, your YouTube journey started during that, that um, you know, early transition period after medical school. Like, what was the impetus that actually said, you know, made you say, hey, I'm, I'm going to make YouTube videos. Like, why? P people was, ask me this all the time. And I, and I and, uh, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, but what what do you say like to this question? Because there's a few ways of tackling it. But what's what do you normally come up with? Well, so for me, my journey was a little bit different. Okay, um, and that's because uh, my sons, I, I have three children, two two boys and a, a young girl. Um, so m my sons and their friends were all into YouTube, and then they ended up building very large YouTube channels. Okay, so uh, both my right. boys. Oh, my one son has a combined total of 12 million followers on one ch uh, two channels and my other son had over a million um, and then all of their friends had over a million so we we were kind of around that and oftentimes we would be in videos um, in the background my wife and I and people said oh your parents should get a channel so um, we kind of just did a comedy channel for a little bit and and you know, at one point we had over 300,000 subscribers and it, but it was just kind wow. of, it was a lot of work and it was mm. stuff that was not necessarily, um, of that, like of educational value. And I just thought to myself, you know, 
um, if we're going to do this, or if I'm going to do this, I would like to do stuff that's of value um, to people. And, um, you know, not, not to say that comedy is not, not entertain, it's not a value, but I wanted to do something that was a value. And I also wanted to kind of do something that was separate for my son that, that I built myself. So then I said, okay, we're going to stop doing that. I'm going to start my own channel. Uh, it's going to be a Dr. Chris channel. It's going to be about med medicine. And, and like you, I was like, okay, at the start, it's going to be very medically oriented. It's going to be like teaching. And it's like, like what the hell? Pe people, nobody wants to go to medical school. They don't want that, right? They want to have a little bit of, of, of um, medical knowledge. Uh, and mostly be entertained, right? So then I started edutainment. I changed, uh, and I got that term from Patrick Beck David, but um, I changed what I was doing. And it's like, okay, I'm gonna make it entertaining now, right? And, and I'm gonna mostly entertain you. And when you're not paying attention, I'm gonna throw in a little bit of education, right? And, and that, that's where I am today, right? So that's how I got started. And anyway, but that's my story. What about you? Mate, I, well, I never knew that, right? You had a big, you kind of got a bit of YouTube insider information. So you're a little bit. Or big. That's amazing. Yeah, everyone has such a different journey, but I think we kind of end up fulfilling the same thing, don't we? Like what you said, you know, had many parallels with my kind of journey. You know, I think maybe we both took the way we were taught medical education and felt like that's how we do it on YouTube, you know. But obviously, uh, along the way, the, the way that I saw it is at the time, what were people watching on YouTube? Probably things like your um, your son's very successful channel. People wanted fun, engaging content, and you watch that content, and it is brilliant. Like you yeah. watch these these young content creators. I mean, often you know they get taken down a lot of the big creators, but actually, from as a pure entertainment point of view, they are doing what TV studios, film studios are failing to do. They're engaging an audience, really connecting with people. And, you know, maybe they don't have that message there. Um, and then at the time I looked at what the online d doctors were doing or what the kind of medical community, the education was doing. And that was very stale. And I was like, well, how can, just like you, how can we deliver that, you know, the good information uh, in a way that people are doing it more like YouTube? But also there's definitely an appetite there, right? I mean, look at, you know, TV shows and you know, people are interested in the medical professional. They want to know about it. And I don't know um, if you remember before you're a doctor, it's actually really difficult to find out what medicine's really like. Mm. So, so then actually create those videos that, you know, peer behind the curtain in a really fun way, not in a stuffy doctor patient consultation way. People like that. And that's, um, I kind of sort of semi stumbled upon it, but once you hit it, you realize, you know, that's what people want and that kind of works. For sure. And it's funny, you know, like um, you talked about, uh, you know, looking behind the curtain and, and seeing medicine, but not in a stuffy way. And uh, like when I talk to people about how I am in medicine, people, and I compare that to my videos, people sometimes will, if they, they're new to the channel, they'll watch the video and they're like, why, why are you like that? Like, dude, calm down and like i'm i'm I, th this is me it, if yeah. you saw me in the hospital that this yeah. is me right like i i kind of say to people I, i'm like i'm a medical jackass you know like i i yeah. love what i do and don't get me wrong i take orthopedic surgery very very seriously right but well, this is i the also people recognize often see making yeah people often see making jokes as not being serious and good at what you do right sorry just interrupt there for sure no no for sure but it's like I, I but I don't I recognize um that I can't take myself too serious myself I can't take myself too seriously right and and you will understand this people people don't get it right I often talk to people about the black sense of humor that we have in medicine right uh, which is a bit a bit of a defensive defense mechanism for us right because the stuff when you hear the stories that we hear you see the kinds of things that we see you you have to have a little bit of detachment from that right um because if you don't you you're going to burn yourself out so you know i i i love what i do and yes i take it very seriously but i also like i i want to live until i'm 80 or something right like i, I don't want to die of a heart attack at the age of 50 so i i need to just be kind of relaxed and 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 
you know what, I want to wake up in the morning and, and, and enjoy what I'm doing and have fun. So I'm, I, I'm pretty lighthearted, man. And, and, and that's, yeah. I, I'm that way in my videos, but I'm that way in real life. So. Yeah. But also what you, the way you are in videos, and I think a lot of the medical YouTubers is actually what it's like to work as a doctor in the medical profession. You know, it's not like we sit around, you know, and, you know, stare at x-rays all day and go, hmm, what's yeah. this? You know, we use very informal language often, hmm. you know? Like, we'll often say, oh, you know, this chap's x-ray is heading in the wrong direction, or, well, you know, we won't use proper medical terms the whole time. We'll we'll speak in, in very informal language often. And, yeah, like you say, that, that dark sense of humour, but it's team building, and this is it's a much more realistic view on who doctors are, you know, uh, uh, but obviously, as you said, we, it, professionalism isn't just being very formal in that way. It's about often breaking down, you know, humor and chatting like that is, is another level of communication. And if it's used in the right way, it's, you know, it's a, an important part of, you know, what we do. For sure, like, um, and I don't, I don't know if they have a similar thing in the UK, but in um, the the College uh, of Physicians and, and Surgeons in Canada, they have these roles. They're called CanMeds roles, okay. And one of the roles is the physician as a communicator, right? And so um, when I think back to my own um, my own life. My, my page, both of my parents were um, factory workers, okay? They had grade 10 level education, that's it, okay? And, but they were very old school. And so when they went to the physician, they were uh, of the, you know, they were of the generation where you sit, you listen, you don't ask questions, you, and you agree with the, what the doctor said. So my parents would do that. And I'm, I'm the first one in my family to go to university. I'm the first one to have a, a sec, post-secondary education. So my, my parents would go to the doctors. The doctor would say things to them. They would, um, they would go, yes, 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 not ask any questions. Then they'd get off the phone. My parents would call me and they'd say, hey, Chris, um, the doctor said this. What does this mean? What am I supposed to do? And and I kind of was like, what the hell? Like, wh like, why would you do that? You're there. Ask them a question. And I made an, a conscious effort. You know, I, I remember a lot of my um, a lot of my re reviews when I was going through residency. Oh, you know, Chris is a, a is a, a competent resident, but he spends a lot of time talking to people. Like you spend too much time, right? And I thought to myself, I made an effort, and I made a promise to myself, I will never be the physician where people leave my office and they have to call somebody else. I don't want that. And and I always, it's a big part of my assessment when I'm talking to a patient, um, is what level of understanding do they have? so that I can bring this conversation down or up to their level, right? And that's how I want to talk to them. And, and a whole part of why I'm not so serious, I'm not trying to be so stuffy, like shirt and tie all the time, is because I want to be approachable. I want people to understand and I want them to feel comfortable asking me questions, right? And, and when you come to my clinics, I'm always behind. I, like I schedule my clinics um, and I, I hate to be behind. I hate to make people wait, but I'm always behind. Why? Because the last thing that I always say to people is this, do you have any additional questions? And then I let them answer, I let them ask the questions and I answer their questions, right? Because I don't want anybody to leave and not, not understand things, right? And I use humor when I talk to people because a lot of the times as a surgeon, the stuff that I'm saying to people is stressful, right? And, and yeah. try to make people feel a little bit better. Sometimes you use a little bit of humor, and, um, you know, and just try to be lighthearted, not make things so serious, because they're already going, what, you, what, I need surgery? Oh, my God, and I'm going to be off work for how long, you know? So, um, yeah, patients pick up on that. And, um, you know, having worked with, uh, you know, consultants like yourself, it, the patients really respond to it. Obviously, you tune in to which patients, you know, you could say that the right things and that, that comes with experience. But yeah, in my experience, you know, doing a ward round with a consultant and, you know, they they can get away with saying the most 
mad stuff because it's a, it's also a confidence thing, isn't it? And if you're relaxed, that shows your, you know, it, it puts the patient at ease. And I, I could definitely, definitely relate to that. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is, is um, education uh, and teaching. So, and you've been a junior, um, a junior physician for, for several years uh, right. and, and training um, medical students. But when you think about YouTube, do you think that YouTube is an effective medium uh, to use for education? I think it absolutely is. I mean, I did a little straw poll of the students I teach and I, I try and this, this is way back when I first became um, a teaching doctor. I said, you know, how do you actually get your information? You know, is it lectures? Is it, and obviously everyone learned in different ways, but so many people said YouTube videos, you know, stuff like osmosis and um, other, you know, great resources. That's kind of one of my favorites, but what staggered me is that, hang on a minute, you've got universities here who get the money and the resources and they have the actual, you know, students and the, you know, their job is to train people yet loads of students, I mean, more than half said that they get the majority of their learning from YouTube videos or <laughs> online resources. And it's incredible, isn't it? Because, you know, you have the arguably all the university doing is providing the exams and the kind of framework now i'm doing a massive disservice i'm probably going to get loads of complaints from universities now <laughs> but i mean th that is the reality though because in a way that it's more difficult for universities in a way because what do people do in their spare time well they use the internet they use youtube so it becomes it's almost their natural window into things and then you have some you know these people that produce amazing content and they make money now so they can make these kind of amazing resources and the the emphasis you know the it's a struggle for the universities to match that um so yeah i i think it's really changed medical education and i don't think there will it, it, this might surprise a lot of people watching medicine is so cutting edge but also so archaic in many other ways um, and the idea of a med school is always going to exist. And, you know, I really think a medical school should try and be a bit entrepreneurial and be like, right, let's adopt some of these great videos and be part sure. of it and really try and, you know, bring that into the syllabus, whether they will, I'm not sure. But yeah, I mean, that's a really long winded way of saying <laughs> I think it has, you know, been a such a it's been the biggest change in the last sort of five, 10 years of education. I mean, I wouldn't just say YouTube, but primarily YouTube. I think that's the, the biggest online way of people learn. For sure. And it's funny, you know, um, so as part of my journey to being here, um, I was actually a teacher prior to this. So I was a high school biology um, and uh, general science teacher. And um, when I, you know, when I think about teaching the public or teaching students, a lot of my orthopedic colleagues, so I, I work at a community hospital. Um, and, and um, but I, you know, I have many colleagues that um, are in my city that work in the teach it's several of the teaching hospitals. And they kind of look at what I'm doing. And they're like, yo, man, why, why, why would you do that? Like, <laughs> what, I don't get it. And, and, you know, and I say, well, hey, you know, this is an opportunity. Obviously, you guys teach medical students, you teach residents, um, and and that's your thing, and you do that in the community or in the academic setting. I said, I can teach everybody, man. I can teach everybody and anybody. The world is my oyster because you, everybody gets YouTube, right? And I, I am not, uh, uh, you know, I don't have any of the um, restrictions that you might have, right? And and also I can, as you said, what I do is very responsive. If there is a trend out, I see a trend, something, a new topic, a news topic, whatever, I can make a video on that today, put that out tomorrow. And already, like, I don't have to worry about changing my course syllabus uh, or any of that kind of stuff, right? I don't have to get approval from the department. I just it's like, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to make something on it, right? And, and the other thing is, like, um, the, the people who, like, my, my teaching doesn't have to be just relegated to medical students, fellows, residents. It, it, my teaching can go to anybody. anybody. If you click on my thumbnail, 
You can be a physio, you can be a uh, Joe Blow, you can be a plumber, you can be an electrician. That topic just interests you. You can click on the thumbnail, you can learn about this thing. And so I, I think it's a, a huge tool. And, I, and as, as you said, it, it's time. Um, and I think that some places are starting to, to recognize this, but it's time that, yo man, times are changing. Get with the program. This is how kids consume information. And if you want to be part of that, want to be relevant, then this is, you're going to start to adopt these principles, right? Have you, um, on, on that point, have you seen a change in attitude of these people that when you started out were going, what are you doing, man? Have, have they sort of come round? Well, so um, in my local community, uh, not really, a few people, okay um have but in the wider orthopedic community or community people are starting to to um understand so for example um as i said i'm not i'm not an academic orthopedic surgeon although i love teaching um, i'm not, research is not really big for me and so uh, i'm not in an academic setting but uh you know last year uh, our, our orthopedic association, Ontario, Ortho, so our provincial orthopedic association, they had me as a guest to speak about um, social media use in orthopedics. And then this past summer, the Canadian Orthopedic Association uh, had me as a guest to speak about um, you know, uh, social media use and how to implement it and how to get started. And, and so the wider organizations are recognizing that this is something that they need to mm. adopt and, and, you know, get on board with um, or get left behind. But I think on a local individual surgeon level, they still don't get it. And, and you know, I'm not going to lie. I love like. I love it because it's fun. I get to talk about things I get to, that I want to talk about and I get to educate um, people. But yes, there, and there is also um, a monetary incentive, right? Like, and that, you know, which you had mentioned, we can get paid for this. So it's not like we can, we're teaching and we don't get anything. You know, if we monetize our videos effectively, if we have good engagement, um, it, then there's an opportunity to, to make an income. And so for, from, you know, one thing that I really learned during COVID, especially the initial part of COVID, I used to say, oh, I'm a surgeon, I'm fine. And I, I don't have to worry, I make good money, mm -hmm. no issues. Uh, except that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in Canada, our government is like socialized, right? It's uni everybody universal access. So I have one payer it's the government. And then, oh, wait, the government now says I'm shutting down ORs for six months. It's like six months where uh, like I was not working as a surgeon. And it's like, oh, wow, I really need to diversify my income stream because <laughs> six months not working, uh, that, that hurts a little bit, you know? And, you know? and I recognize lots of people were out of work, but Holy crap! And six months. That that. Mate, I had no idea. Are you are you back? Are you back at it now with lots of, you know, safety yeah. stuff in place? Yeah. For sure, we're 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 back at it. We're not 100% capacity uh, no. at this point, um, and we've had to do sort of rolling shutdowns uh, and then reopenings. Yeah. But um, yeah, no. So we're 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 back at it, and so I, I, I have to tell you, I'm I'm very happy to be working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what a lot of people don't realize, obviously, you do emergency work and elective work. Um, a lot of people, I mean, they've been kind of up in arms, you know, the UK about lots of the elective work being cancelled. Um, you know, rightly so, because it has huge impacts on people's lives. But what people don't realize is that when you go into a hospital, even just to have this elective work, your risk of, you know, getting something like COVID is is increased. For and sure, you know, so and so people just see the knock on effect. And I'm just going to extend that out to a more kind of serious issue. And that's people with cancer diagnosis that need their elective surgery. Right. So you think, well, why would you delay cancer surgery? Well, because if someone with cancer gets covid, that is very bad. 20 percent uh, so, increase in mortality, man. You know, there you go. Um, so, yeah. And so these are these are huge issues aren't they and and people don't realize that you know it can it, it impacts every area of medicine doesn't it mm -hmm. anyway just to digress um but what i wanted to just mention um it's funny you said that you know people that you work with haven't really come around to the idea of 
you do the YouTube videos because that maybe Canada are a little bit behind at the moment but certainly in my hospital there's been a just a complete u-turn in the kind of uh, uh the way the staff talked to me about the YouTube so initially I think is that some famous quote about first of all people you know ridicule you then they ignore you then they want to be you or whatever it is. I've, I've totally paraphrased yeah, yeah. that wrong but no, I know I, what you're saying but when I first started loads of my friends who I work with was like what are you doing like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mate, you know, why are you going on YouTube? You know, it's isn't it embarrassing? And I guess the first videos were a little bit janky, but you know, you push through. And now several of my friends have started YouTube channels. Um, people talk to me about it all the time. I think, you know, obviously some not everyone likes everything you do. It do it, that's just the risk you take when you do anything. Um but actually people the warmth i've got and it's added so much more to my day job like people it's a conversation for you know i get a porter just last week i had a porter just in the corridor i saw your video mate that was really good how you doing <laughs> and it, it's just yeah it does it has added a, a it's ad, actually added to my my work in terms of the enjoyment and the the interaction with people and I, I feel like people i mean i don't want to put words in their mouth but i feel like they're kind of quite proud of how how it's gone and you know telling the story of of my hospital a little bit you know through some of the videos yeah no i i think that's i i hope that that's going to to happen with um, my orthopedic community. And I don't know whether it's because they're just a little bit stuffy or whatever. Um, and, and to be honest, there's other uh, orthopedic surgeons, you know, there's a, a group of orthopedic surgeons that I sort of um, create content and we share it or, or we promote, we, you know, promote each other's content uh, online. Right. Some of them are from the wider orthopedic community in Canada, but you know, it's, I, as you said, first, first they laugh at you, then they ignore you and then they want to be right. So I, I think it will happen. Um, I just, you know, it is what it is, but um, I, I do think there's a lot of patients that um, when I meet them for the first time, they say, oh, you know, I saw your video on this, right? Or, you know, I've been fought, they'll, they'll say, I follow you on, on YouTube, I follow you on Instagram, and I love your content. And, and right there, that is a thing that where already you're, you're kind of breaking down this, this barrier between the patient and the physician, and you're opening up a road of communication already, you're allowing them to feel comfortable and, and, you know, let them know that you are approachable. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think there's so many benefits to this. Um, and as with anything, you know, um, there are disadvantages as well, but I, I do think that the, the benefits greatly outweigh any potential disadvantages. I mean, what do you think some of the, the disadvantages are then? Just so I can just make sure I'm not doing them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, like I said, they're, so there, you know, we, we have to remember, we do have a um, patient physician relationship, right? And so there is, when somebody watches all your content, obviously they feel, they feel very familiar with you. And so sometimes you have to say to people, I know you follow me on all this and, and I greatly appreciate all of that, but th this is a professional relationship, right? Like you, right. you're coming to, like, I'm not seeing you in the bar. We're not chatting over drinks. You've come to me for a clinical reason. And I have a role that I have to play with you um, in, in order to facilitate that. And, you know, from a medical legal perspective, the college, um, you know, puts boundaries around that relationship. And right. so, uh, so, you know, sometimes people get a little bit too comfortable and, you know, they kind of, because they see you, you're like this quote unquote celebrity, they think, oh my God, like I, I, I know this person and I know everything about them. So sometimes there has to be a little bit of a difference or a little bit of a distance. Um, but, you know, I, I, yeah, I think there, there's that. And I, the other thing that I think is just that um, 
we are in control of the media that the content that we create but to some extent your your there's stuff about you if you are true to what you are producing you put your heart and soul into it there is elements of you that are going to come through when you when you do that and and you're basically putting that out on the internet to live there forever and so the the downside is is you have to be very cautious uh, about what you want to get out right because it's out there forever and and people get to peer inside a small window into your head right and so that is sometimes an element of concern but i'm i'm you know like i said i um i'm pretty much what you see is what you get and, and so if you see it on the outside it's probably on the inside the same so i think some of the dangers we can get towards is i think what you said about celebrity is an important one you know because as much as i think it's one thing to show you know what we do in terms of a light-hearted look at medicine you know peering behind the scenes but you know we don't want to give a false view of what medicine is either you know we don't want to be the doctor who looks you know who acts like the doctor in a tv show you know <laughs> when it comes down to it we have to get that balance right and we say look you know we we present stuff in a more engaging way hopefully but then ultimately we have to really say you know when stuff gets real this is this is you know this is where we have to really step up and you know a lot of people might sort of see the kind of more glamorous aspect and i don't think that does the profession any good so i think we that's one thing i try and be mindful of and the other thing is i think money as well you know we have to be very careful that we don't abuse the privilege that's been bestowed on us as doctors to then use that to really you know sell things that you know really aren't part of it and you know there's guidelines in the UK about that but um you know I do I, I think the big YouTubers that I see kind of know it's a gray area isn't it that we don't have direct guidelines but you know if you read between the lines of of our medical license there's a lot of I would say YouTubers or celebrity or social media doctors who are breaking through now and are kind of getting it a bit wrong in my opinion um so you know I'm, I'm pretty sure and you know in the UK about last year there was a a big article um you know criticizing lots of doctors that were promoting certain products and yeah and the weird thing is in the medical community we were pretty much divided so I saw this particular article posted on a forum that I'm on just for doctors on Facebook and I was really surprised because for me I was like you know I thought they were bang to rights I thought they'd really you know they shouldn't be doing that type of thing and then but you know the the medical community responded was really divided people saying look nothing wrong with it other other celebrities earn money and they're they're earning money through actually talking majority of the time about good things so i think you know, because the medical community is divided it, it is this kind of gray area and yeah I, I i i that is a one area of worry for me that we have to get it right mm -hmm. most definitely um it, it's it's uh well, as soon as you bring in this idea of money, right? Um, because the whole the whole idea of being a physician is like, well, it's an altruistic profession, and you're supposed to want to do this to be, um, you know, for the good of people, for the good of mankind. And you guys make a crap ton of money anyway, so why would you ever want to get, um, you know, remunerated? And and it, and I think, well. You know, I, I do want to help people, man, and and I, um, I, 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 if I if I, you know, were to think, would I do this if I made nothing, you know? And if I if I knew that I had all of my, I said this before. I remember saying this during my interview for medical school. I said, if if I if I um, knew that my family's needs were were taken care of, I would do this for nothing because I, I I enjoy it that much and I think it's that important. But I also, you know, now as a physician that's working, I have a business, I have, you know, 11 employees that I have to pay on a bi-weekly basis. <laughs> right. I think, wow. you know, if, if I can have 
um, a, another stream of income um, to help with that, then I, I don't think that there's a problem as long as I am um, maintaining my um, mm -hmm. the Hippocratic oath, do yep. no harm, right? And as long as uh, I am maintaining my focus on providing value, content, uh, valuable content um, and information for the public or for whoever my audience is, I, I don't think there's there's a problem with with being remunerated for, for that. It's weird because you're you're absolutely right, and it, it comes down to almost the the people don't mind people earning money. It's almost that people just don't like hypocrisy, don't they? So if you were, you know, I'm just going to pick this at random, but just say someone that worked in the city, just a nondescript city job. If you were kind of, you know, making money out of cigarettes, making loads of money out of it, people won't really criticize it. It's like, oh, you've gone into that. That's what you've signed up for. Fine. But as soon as you go into something good, if you then make money out of that, people are like, whoa, 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 you hypocrite. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Surely you want to create opportunities for people to do good things in the world by rewarding them. It's not like a race to the bottom, like who can be the biggest, make the biggest sacrifice, who can, you know, earn the least amount of money but do the most amount of good. You know, there has to be a balance somewhere. But, um, but yeah, but also as doctors, we can't completely abuse that, our platform and the you know I, I very much feel like the uh, as I said before that the idea of being a doctor is something that we don't own that's been passed to that's a privilege that has been bestowed on us and that we thought we have to represent and be a good example and you know within that we have to not abuse that right to then <laughs> just purely make money for ourselves yeah no I hear you so tell me um when you are creating your content now Okay. Um, in your head, um, who is your intended ideal audience? Yeah, I, it's funny. I've thought about this a lot and I've kind of figured it out. I've got the exact person in mind. So <laughs> I basically create content for myself 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, I was worked in advertising. I was one of those people that worked in the, in the city. For <laughs> what we were just talking about earlier. Um, and yeah, I, I wanted to get into medicine. I had a, an interest in, you know, doing something that was a bit more fulfilling. And, you know, I watched YouTube and I enjoyed medical TV shows and I wanted to know a little bit more about it. And my own experience of medicine was either TV shows or being a patient, which, you know, going to the GP with an ear infection. So, that it was well how do I get any more information um I like you didn't have any um doctors or anyone in healthcare in my whole family I've got a big family but they're all in uh, mainly in kind of teaching and engineering and things like that and so yeah how do I get how do I get the information and so it was only when I went through that whole process and then I thought well when I create videos I know exactly who I'm creating them for what what would I would have wanted back then and not just for people that are interested in coming into medicine but as people who are like me that were happy in their job but wanted to learn a bit more about it so that's that's who i uh, pitch things at okay cool cool um now we we talked a little bit before uh just about you know all the different platforms and and creating content for all all these different um platforms and and the different um uh, guidelines that they have and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but first tell me when you're creating content, um, what is the relative proportion of time that you spend each week doing that creating content versus the time that you spend, you know, doing your regular day-to-day -day work as a physician, teaching physician? Yeah. So I try and do, um, 10 hours a week on YouTube. So a full day, um, so when I was working, you know, in my 50-50 role as teaching and, yeah, I was pretty much doing, yeah, two days a week teaching, two days a week in the emergency department and one day um, doing YouTube. And sometimes I'd spread out that YouTube day and try and do a little bit each day. So I'd have, you know, the big filming day um, on one and then actually an editing day on another so I'd, you know film after a shift for example or after a teaching day just for a couple of hours and then edit it all on a day off 
so that would and that I tried to get a structure there but as you know <laughs> being a doctor it isn't a nine to five job so it becomes very difficult because you know you read any productivity guide it's all about consistency and having a sort of set time to you know get up do this um and so I've kind of had to resign myself to realize I'm never going to be that YouTuber who, mm -hmm. you know, gets up, finishes the video before midday, sends it off to an editor, then does my job or, or whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be the guy that has to cobble together stuff if I want to continue, you know, doing the job I do, which is, is exactly what I want to do. So, um, yeah, so that, that's how I uh, try and piece up the time. There you go. I, 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 I always... Um, you know, look at these uh, productivity guides, as you say, and, and that's the first thing they talk about structure. And I'm like, yeah, shit, that'd be nice. Uh, I, I, I technically that that works. But then, as you said, you know, things, oh, shit, the OR ran late today. So um, that yeah. time that I was supposed to be filming, and yeah. I'm not using filming, or like, um, you know, I'm, I'm on call. And although I had scheduled in a filming session or an editing session, guess what, I'm fixing hip fractures, <laughs> or like, you yeah. know what I mean? So um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult, but I am getting, I don't know what your setup is like, but I'm getting to the point now where, um, you know, because my wife and I are trying to run like four different channels, um, we're, my wife right now does primarily uh, most of the editing and, but we're getting to the point where it's like, okay, you know what, we really need to hire an editor. And even if it's somebody who's part-time, we need to get somebody on board to learn what, learn our channels, learn what we do, learn our style um, so that we can then offload some of that work to them so that we can focus on content creation because um, I, I love the editing. I love putting in memes. I love doing that. I love cutting the footage, but again, if you can find somebody who's really good at that, they're fast at it, um, it, it, it just frees up endless number of hours where you could be doing the primary thing, which is making the content. So. Yeah, and people don't, people don't realize that they think YouTube is a very social extrovert game because they see you on camera and you're chatting and you're energetic. I mean, like your Mortal Kombat video you did the other day was absolutely brilliant. That type of thing, they see that kind of level of energy and excitement and they think that's what we do. But actually, we do that for like 20 minutes and then we sit, <laughs> we sit in quiet for 10 hours watching yeah. ourselves be energetic. I mean, it's a real introvert game. Um, and you're, yeah. you're absolutely right in terms of the, so much of the story is produced in the edit, right? You know, you know, it's much like a film, you know, it's written in three ways. It's written with the idea, the filming and the edit. You, the, the edit is so much part of the character and particularly because some of the stuff we're doing, we're talking about, um, we're talking about medicine, right? So you have to inject some of the, the funny insights into medicine, which an editor probably won't know that, right? So to, I've tried um, a few times to get editors on board and it's a real struggle. And I'm, I'm trying now at the moment to really invest in a, a, a relationship with an editor so that, you know, it, they're never going to get it right first time, you know, how you want it. So it's about, um, I'm, so I'm doing the same thing. I want to try and focus on content creation and, you know, really just, even if the first few videos aren't quite how I want them, just keep pushing through, keep, and, you know, these are smart people so i'm sure we're we'll, we'll come to something at the moment but it's something you have to invest and it is a compromise in the short term you know sure. you really have to compromise on on how the videos are going to look and feel but then the outcome is in six months time you're going to be coming up with an idea recording it in like maybe four hours and that's your video that's your big video for the week done instead yeah. of <laughs> 15 hours worth of stuff you know, yep. and the blood, sweat, and tears, and then, and then also, you come to the next video, and you think, I am done for a week. <laughs> look at YouTube after editing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, th that makes me think of two things. So, number one, I remember um, when uh, I was going through residency, and I'm going through my internship, and I'm I'm doing various different specialties, and I did two months in radiology. And I loved looking at X-rays and and CT scans, MRIs, but I thought to myself. 
I, you know what? I can't be in the dark room looking at these screens for 12 hours a day, only to discover like 15 years later as an orthopedic surgeon making social media content. I film, as you see, for like 20 minutes, half an hour. And then I spend the next eight hours in a dark room staring at a screen while I edit this stuff. Right. Yeah. So so that that's, yeah, that that's is so funny. That you know? totally reminds me of one of my friends at medical school who also, um, he had a background in web development. I remember he texted me uh, just sort of a year or two ago and I was, he's a radiologist now. And I sort of said to him, how's life? He goes, well, I went from changing my career because I didn't want to sit alone at a computer typing stuff. And now I sit alone at a computer typing stuff. And it's like, <laughs> this yeah yeah be careful what you wish for yeah exactly exactly <laughs> but you know um to to come back to a second for the uh to the the uh editor it mm. kind of it kind of um reminds me and makes me feel um that it's like the same situation as teaching a surgical resident right um and people don't get this yeah. in that in order for me to become a surgeon there was a time when I wasn't a surgeon. Uh, there was a time when I never had held the knife in my hand or any of the instruments. And so I had to do that uh, for a first time on some patient and somebody had to be looking over my shoulder while I was doing that. And, I, and when I think back, oh, geez, and, and this is a side of medicine that we don't ever talk about, right? But when I think back to things that I, the surgeries that I did when I first started, right? Compared to what I do now, because I have 15 more years of, of knowledge, experience, um, all these other things that I've seen, right? Um, when I look back, I go, oh, geez, you know, yeah, that was, that, that was kind of rough back then. Mm -hmm. And the, the editor, it's kind of like the same thing. It's like the first video that they edit for you, it's like it's you giving them the knife for the first time. And you're like saying, okay, cut here. Don't cut this artery. Don't do this. Don't do that. And, and then you watch them. And then all of a sudden you see bright red blood flowing. And that's the artery that I said not to cut. Uh, but you have to like maintain your cool, right? So that you can go, oh, um, all right. That's not what we were supposed to do, but we're going to fix it and carry on. And, and you can't just like give up, you know, the first time something goes all haywire you know the fracture breaks into 15 more million pieces okay okay that's that's not what we're talking about but we're gonna fix it and then we're gonna keep going right so it's kind of yeah. like that right because you you you, yeah. you they got it you got to teach them and they have to go through those learning steps but you have to recognize in your mind okay mm. this this mm. fracture is not going to be the way that i would fix it yeah. um but it's it's going to be acceptable and then we're going to move yeah. forward and also it, to just jump onto that analogy as well in the long run it's best for you to have a very well-trained junior right so that yes. you can sleep at night <laughs> so that you they they're doing the surgery at night it's the same yes. with the editing like in the lot it's all about the it's the long game isn't it i think when i started out the youtube i wasn't sure how it's gonna how long it's gonna last so i was quite happy just you know taking everything on board myself having full control but actually if you want to grow and as we were talking about off camera before we started, the number of extra stuff, it's not just having one platform that you invest in. It's about having, you know, publishing different content to different ways. And the only way people can do that, match that pressure is, well, either by compromising and say, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do, you know, stay in my area. But if you want to grow, you're going to have to find people to help you out. For sure, for sure, you know, and 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 that's just part of the the process. And and the other thing that I've recognized now, um, you know, I, when I if I think about myself, I think okay, I said as I said to you before, I think I'm a lighthearted guy, and I think I'm a little bit funny, and I think I'm I think I'm I'm you know not I think I'm relatively intelligent, um, but um, you know like. I have to learn about how to, you know, I've been trying to read books about um, storytelling, right? Because it's not just now me giving out information like rote um, and the same way I, I read it in the book. I now have to make an engaging story 
about this information, right? And so uh, I'm trying to read and learn about how to tell stories. But I'm also um, having to, you know, when I think about all of the different types of um, uh, the different social media platforms, I'm also reading about business and marketing, because it's not just about telling stories that are engaging, but it's also about understanding how, like I, I'm trying to build a community, right, around what I, the content that I create. And it's like, well, how do you engage people um, and how do you hook them in, right? And, and so having to learn these, uh, like I was never a business person, man, like none of that, but I think it, it learning marketing skills is an important part of that, right? So you're so right. I mean, the community, you're, you're, you're so right. It's not just like a broadcast YouTube. You put it out and it's out there forever. You know, it's, it's about nurturing that community, isn't it? It's not just about, you know, you put content out and then leave it. You have to engage with that content, listen to the audience. And, um, you know, and you're only going to succeed by fulfilling what the audience wants and also finding new audience, aren't you? And that, like you say, that's, that is about finding those hooks, finding the story, but then also having the business and marketing to, to drive that forward. It is very much a business. It's not just something you do, you know, like you, you know, send a video up and that's it. It's very much, you know, it started for me and I think for you as well, like as a side hustle, but now it's something we actually have to factor into our lives. Very much so, very much so. So when you look to the future, okay, um, what are your goals for your YouTube channel? I'm, I'm actually going through a period of uh, reevaluation, and I don't know if that's, I think maybe in some extent, um, the way YouTube works is you're constantly reevaluating your goals. Um, but really for me, I want to increase my consistency and introduce another kind of thread to the channel so at the moment um you know i've got a kind of good thing in terms of the reaction videos i do you know very similar to yourself finding really great pieces of stuff in the you know in the media like tv shows and films and giving people a little bit more you know information about that um and then recently you know when i realized that the you know, when the, this time last year, pretty much when the, the pandemic kind of came and affected our lives so much that I wanted to tell that story. And that's when I went, you know, more of a conversational thing to a camera, which I've never really done. And that was, you know, talking, you know, about some difficult stuff that you could kind of hide behind in these reaction videos. But now I feel like I want to bring it back to the very core. I want a thread of medical education back in there um, and you know these videos won't be for everyone but I really want to um, create stuff that is a lot more what I do day to day like teaching the medical students because I've had so much experience in that like I've been doing the job three years so I've taught over 300 medical students and you know a lot of the time I'm teaching the same thing to them so I really want to capture those mini and I wouldn't call them lectures because I don't do lectures I just teach them on the ward so it's those little little sort of key lessons and stories that you know that help you in your clinical medicine so I want to find a way of capturing that but equally and this is not really a goal but a way to achieve all of those things the channel is finding a way to do that in a much more productive way and that's you know with the help of other people basically and also with the support of the tools we have on things like YouTube you know things like having you know utilizing more live stuff like now Mm. You know, I mean, traditionally, if we were doing this, you know, we'd do a podcast and, um, you know, we'd do it maybe a podcast format and I wouldn't be able to resist in just cutting a few things out here and there just to, you know, help with, and then you just get into this whole <laughs> developing process of editing and trying to get stuff right. And so, yeah, I want to achieve those goals by getting more people to help me and, um, you know, utilizing the tools a lot more to, to, uh, yeah, get this more ed medical education thing going and to get what I'm doing going as well. Mm -hmm. Now, um, would you ever, uh, and this, this is not, this is not a judgmental question. This is just, sure. I'm, I'm curious, mm -hmm. man. Um, Cause I, I, I love what I do in orthopedics, but I also enjoy what I do uh, for social media and YouTube. And although that's stressful at times, um, but would you ever consider 
going 100% into, um, was, yeah, if, would there ever be a situation where you would consider going 100% into YouTube and, and walking away from medicine? No, definitely not. Um, it, it's, I, I think in a way I've compromised my medical career a little bit because it's, you know, slowed me down because I'm, you know, spending more, I actually spend a, a day a week, like we talked about doing the YouTube where I could be, you know, training a lot more or progressing my career a lot more. Um, but also I feel like I compromise the YouTube channel a bit because I still, I don't ever want to stop being a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe one of the reasons is that, you know, I worked in, um, you know, I worked in advertising. I went to medicine at 28. So I kind of realized I wanted, I needed a job that fulfilled me. And I feel very lucky at the moment because, um, I mean, I don't know how you do it, mate, but working as a full-time doctor is, uh, although I can do it because I did it for a few years, I it it didn't put the best of me. It didn't make me feel totally happy um, because I felt a bit kind of burnt out. Actually, I feel like I like many people, I throw a lot of my heart and soul into things, and it just didn't make me happy. And it didn't. I don't think it made a great for a great patient experience. Like you didn't want you wouldn't want to have met me on day seven compared to day one mm -hmm. of a, a run of shifts. So, um, yeah, so, but then also I get really itchy. So I often, when my students have exams, I take sort of um, a month off and I just help them get through their finals. And after that, I am so ready to get back into the emergency department. I'm literally itching to, you know, get back to seeing patients and doing that thing. So to me, it's, it's a perfect balance. Like, I really feel like I have everything I wanted in a job. Like, I feel like I have the fulfillment, the interest in medicine, the patient experience, not only helping every type of person, but working with every type of person, you know, mm -hmm. that's a real privilege in medicine. We work from, you know, domestic staff all the way up <laughs> to, you know, super duper kind of consultants. We see every type of person in YouTube. You just don't get that, you know, it, and I think a lot of times, um, particularly people can get unhappy with, um, with life. And I think, the trick is to make your life as real as possible and it don't get much more real than medicine so i feel like that is really where i enjoy stuff but i do have a huge creative muscle that i need to flex um the youtube totally fulfills that and also as you said earlier it gives you this kind of global audience what other thing can you do where you spend an hour filming something <laughs> a day editing it but then you put it out and suddenly everyone around the world engages in it. I mean, that's really special. And so for me, I feel like it's a, it's a real perfect balance. For sure. And, and it's, you know, just to, to, to add to that, you know, I, 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 when I saw people scrolling through the, or, you know, when the comments are flying by, you know, I, it's, I always am amazed when I look at my own comments uh, on videos and People say, oh, hello from here, hello from Pakistan, hello from this place, hello from Australia. And I, and, and I think like when I actually sit back to think about that for a second, I'm like, wait a minute. Like I got people like around the, from the furthest point from my present location around the world <laughs> watching this video. Like, I, I just think that that's incredible. And as you said, it's like, what, what, where else could you do that? You know what I mean? So uh, I, yeah, I think it's, it's, um, uh, it's but what hard. About, sorry. No, it's, it's hard to do what we do, but I think it, we, yeah, I think it's, it's very rewarding to do both the, the medicine and to do this. Someone's just said hello from Philippines in the chat. Yes. Wow, well, look at that. Perfect yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello See from that? There you go. Giddy up, man. And Germany. This We're is it all over and this is this is what i'm talking about man italy it's... we're just going to be naming countries now um but yeah hello to everyone out there um but i mean guess same question to you though i mean the social media thing is you know it's very rewarding would you consider just moving full-time into uh no i i um as as stressful as it is trying to manage both careers <laughs> like um um, I am a surgical gorilla, right? That's, that's what they, they, that's how people look at orthopedic surgeons. And I love to be there, man. Like I love to the tools. I love to do stuff. I love it when, you know, the, the, I come in and the bone looks like this and, and I can do this. Like, I, I think that's magical. Right. So I love to be there and I love to do that, but 
uh, you know, on the other hand, I love the education. I love to have fun. And, and when I'm talking about these topics, you know, like Mortal Kombat, that, to be honest, like that last video was one of my, like I've done, I don't know, 180 videos or something. That was one of my favorite um, because just because like I grew up playing video, like mm -hmm. no, That's a brilliant no, idea. Brilliant. no lie, you know, like I played those games and I, and I, if I had more time, I would play video games now. Mm -hmm. I don't, but I, it, I genuinely love that. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about this. This is, this is something that I like. Right. So um, I, I think that um, despite the, mm -hmm. the amount of time that these two things consume, um, I can't see myself going okay. completely in that direction because it, it would not allow me to do the orthopedics. But now that I am doing the YouTube, I wouldn't just go back to doing orthopedics because I love the ability to communicate with people from around the world, people at all different levels of training. Um, and, and I just think that that's, that's incredible, right? So I, I, would, I would continue to do it. I, I want to, as you said, the on my social media content side i need to build a team right and so that will take some time to build a team to help me but that's how i will amplify my message um but i would never go one or the other um i think that both are here to stay mm -hmm. so now, now we talked a little bit about other platforms so obviously oh. for both of us youtube is our our base platform, but, um, you know, have you thought about the other platforms and obviously here you are on Instagram, so you have, you have some <laughs> stuff and you're on Twitter, but have you thought about the other platforms and sort of expanding more into the other platforms? I know. I mean, I have thought about it, but it's just not something that I am I'm, I'm making part of what I do. So I, I do have presence on the other things, but they're really just a point. It's, to, it's just to help people engage with me, first of all, if people want to, um, you know, uh, email me or send me messages or tag me in photos and things or, or tweets. That's kind of why I have them. But it's mainly just to point everything onto YouTube. And I made that decision pretty much a year ago because, yeah, time was a factor, but, you know, also these things move so quickly and I'm, I'm not I'm actually not a very despite having a, my first degree in computer science and having a YouTube channel I'm actually don't enjoy spending lots of time at computers and I'm not this person that's always ready for the next thing and uh you know check out this um you know clubhouse or whatever the next kind of uh, big <laughs> big app is um so yeah because and also I kind of feel like you know, if something's not part of your personality, don't try and force it, you know, just focus on the things that work for you. Um, so yeah, I've kind of put all my eggs in the YouTube basket. So when it when it goes under next week, you won't see me again. <laughs> well, you know, it's the one thing that I thought about. Um, I remember, um, and I can't remember who I said this, but I, I remember watching a couple of videos on this topic. Maybe multiple people were saying this. <clears throat> But the idea of be building, um, you know, content and putting it only on YouTube, they were saying, well, you know, when when we do that, we are basically building a business rent, you know, we're, we're building a factory on rented land, right? And, and anytime the, the, the landowner can go, uh, you know what, um, yeah. I'm, I'm changing. The, and, and when they <laughs> said that, I was like, yeah, you know what, I, I, that makes me a little bit nervous, right? And, and when I look to my, uh, you know, even to my son, uh, right now, my son, uh, one of my sons is working on, so he has like a thousand videos on YouTube, right? And, wow, or, or more. And, and so now he is working with a business. He's, he's um, just starting to um, bring all of that content over to Facebook, right? Because he kind of, you know, he's over the years, uh, he's had um, his fair share, of um, you know, copyright Ooh. strikes or, or whatever. Like if you put out that much content, um, these kinds of things are gonna happen, right? And he's just kind of, even though he's done very well for himself, um, he's kind of come to the realization uh, after having to deal with YouTube administration many times, it's like, oh, geez, yeah, I'm building on rented land. And at any time, 
they decide they want to change the ecosystem, they want to do whatever, then you're SOL, right? And yeah. so he, he's now said, okay, I'm going to build, put, bring that over to another uh, place. And, I, and I've always kind of, he's looked to uh, us, my, my wife and I, for business guidance, although he makes way more money than I do. Um, and, um, and, I, and I've said to him, yeah, you know what? You need to diversify, man. Like, and you need to give yourself a little bit of protection. Um, and, and so whether that is businesses outside of social media, so getting into real estate or whatever, or whether within social media, diversifying yourself among platforms, um, then yeah, you, you need to have some other kind of safety net or, or whatever. So, it, you know, YouTube remains at, and I think it will continue to be for, for myself, my main um, content uh, sort of hub, but um, I am trying to work uh, as I, as we talked about before, how to figure out not necessarily to make more content, right? But right. how how to take the content that I make for YouTube and then repurpose it for mm. TikTok, Instagram, blah blah blah. Um, can't can't use it for Clubhouse because Clubhouse is audio, but but mm. trying to figure out how to repurpose it for all these different things. Mm so that I can, you know, have a little bit of a safety net in case YouTube doesn't whatever, yeah. you know? I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And it, it comes back to thinking about the idea, you know, in its infancy and, and when you're creating it, how you can roll that out. I mean, I'm pretty sure you're not always to talk about this video, but the Mortal Kombat one, you can easily put that on TikTok, can't you? Like the best Mortal Kombat, and, you know, get that cut nicely, but then, it is more work. And I think for me, it's always like, right, I've got some time. Do I, you know, create a load of stuff to put on my Instagram or do I just create another video for YouTube? <clears throat> and I always felt like for me, the limiting factor for me is just fulfilling that audience on YouTube, which I still feel like, you know, I, I, I'm always chasing that still. And uh, maybe I'll always feel like that. But um, yeah, I feel like you kind of, yeah, I totally get what you say. I, I mean, I definitely need to, to, think about how I can diversify that but also I feel like I need to kind of secure my base first you know mm -hmm. get the YouTube really rocking really happy with that um you know where I want it to be and then it's the time to to grow out for sure well geez man I I, I feel bad for my because I, I go like you're you want to secure your base and I'm like wait a minute your your base is like nine times bigger than mine <laughs> what what the hell am I doing I I need to fo I need to like focus on what I'm doing I guess you know I'm well, yeah I'm, I mean, I'm kind of all over the it. place yeah I mean there's not enough hours of the day isn't it I guess there's no right strategy isn't it ultimately you have to be uh, happy what you're doing and and the way you're doing it but yeah it's, it's it's what i want to do i want to like you get just a small team a couple people that can help me um first of all get get much more consistency with the channel and then look to broaden out into other areas yes for sure so um let me switch gears here uh hmm. before before we finish up um let me ask you so how has uh this is a two-part question sure. so how has covid uh affected uh, or impacted your work as an emergency physician and then um second part how has it affected in turn your uh work as a content creator okay yeah it's been uh, an extremely <laughs> challenging year as everyone knows i'm not going to sort of repeat what everyone kind of knows um and really i think what a lot of people don't really understand is covid the uncertainty that covid created on a day-to-day -day basis things were just changing every single day you know we're used to dealing with sick people people with infectious conditions but when there's a lot of unknown and things are changing in terms of how the hospital's laid out you know how you treat how you treat people with covid the kind of ppe and not knowing what's going to happen particularly when you're seeing scary things from around the world it was really for me it was defined as a kind of uncertain period in the emergency department it was really only the second wave at my hospital that got really um, affected. And really just for a few weeks, I felt like I was really in a pandemic in terms of the number of patients you saw. And it was pretty, pretty scary. Um, 
also what I think a lot of people don't realize is that although it impacted the whole of the health system, it really was a strain on particular aspects of people dealing with COVID. I know there were, you know, we had to all, every single department, you know, you know, even orthopedics, as we talked about, would had to change what they were doing but really it was my colleagues in general medicine and ICU that were undergoing immense pressure and I found that difficult as a content creator because to try to tell that story so I took the decision quite early to talk about what I was about to go through because you could see some of the stuff coming out of Italy and you know really it was a story to be told by the ICU people and the medical um you know the medical doctors and that's why I've got you know my colleagues that um you know that I've worked with before to kind of tell those stories on the channel as well but also you know tell a little bit about what's happening on the front door as well because in very much what happens on the front door is kind of where the hospital's going in the next few weeks so either cases are going to increase or cases are going to decrease the real difficult thing for me that brings the two things together was that I personally had a it didn't although it didn't affect me in a huge way covid by that i mean i still went to work every day i mean obviously i moved out of the house i was in because i was currently living at my folks at the start of the pandemic and they were shielding but it didn't i was still going to work earning money coming back in my life okay you know you weren't seeing as many people and things but it didn't change crazy amounts and you know a lots of people in lockdown were facing much more severe things so financial hardship trying to look after their kids at home you know really difficult times and then on top of that people losing loved ones when the death you know the deaths really started going you know we have 120,000 have sadly died in the UK um, and it's difficult then to tell a positive story when you have such difficult stuff going on because you don't you you don't want to undermine what's what's happening, um, and almost yeah you, know, you want to tell your truth, but then you you also need to look at it in the wider context. So that was always the balance I was trying to make when I was producing content. Um, yeah, so that was just something I was very conscious of, and yeah, I, it was it was a new thing for me you know, new thing for me to do to talk about what's happening on the ground. And it didn't come without its criticism, like, you know, mainly people who were, you know, struggling with COVID, struggling with the realities of what it was. And, you know, thinking the information was, was, you know, I was part of some Bill Gates employee to put things <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, so well, one of the videos actually got like proper targeted. So, you know, my like to dislike ratio is always yeah, close to like 95 percent, 99 percent. One yeah. video got picked up by some shared around and it, it got absolutely ratioed to something like 70 <laughs> percent. And the comments of people like this guy's a fraud. I've seen him on acting on other stuff. And it was just it, it was kind of hilarious. But then you realize the darker truth of that, of, you know, this is real. We are in a pandemic and, yes. and I've become this kind of target of this, you know, the COVID conspiracy thing. So that was a new thing for me to go through. But as always, it was a learning experience and it helped me feel really connected with lots of people, you know, not just in my little bubble of work and hospital, I felt like people, I was able to share the story of what's happening and equally people commenting and people in the community, I was able to experience what was happening elsewhere. Yeah, no, I, 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 um, I think that it is, um, you know, it's, as you say, we want to tell our story, but we need to recognize the, the, the wider story um, and, it, Things may suck, you know, and, I, and as I said, oh, I wasn't working for six months. Um, that kind of sucked, but it, you know, when I think about the wider context, um, it's like, geez, man, well, this is, it, it was terrible for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as you said, people like, we're, we're in the hospital every day. And as you said, like, I, oh, geez, wasn't ICU over there? yesterday oh well 
now they, they need to appropriate this space because they need 15 more ventilators. And now this is also an ICU and just that, that, that uncertainty in the hospital. And then it's like, oh, well, we've now, you know, new research has shown, oh, well, geez, you, you need to do this. Uh, it's an aerosol generating procedure, bang. You need to be in a negative ventilation room. And all of a sudden uh, that's changed the flow of patients through in and out of the OR. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, well, we only have two negative pressure rooms here. Um, and we, you have to wait after, you know, after an AGMP, you got to wait for, for 29 minutes um, in order before you can do anything, go out of the room because that, that's the time it takes for it to be down 99% of the, the, the viral particles in the air. And I'm like, like all of these things that you, that you, that you don't yeah. know that's so uncertain. Yeah. Um, but what's funny as well is they bring in this kind of thing like, oh, and I was like, hang on a minute. We've just spent four weeks of going straight in operation. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Did that not matter now? But that is, <laughs> that is medicine, isn't it? You know, you, you learn. You know, science isn't about being right at, it's about being right at a particular time. At a particular time with yeah. what you have. Jeez, yes, yeah. exactly. It's like, and, and then when you think back, you go, oh my God, wait a minute. We were just walking in the room for like, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's almost yeah. as if we were like doing the matrix because you know the information now. And it's like, it's like, woo, I was dodging all of these bullets before and somehow managing not to get hit. Right. And you go, holy shit, we were really lucky. Right. Like we were really yeah. lucky. So, yeah. Well, that's the sad thing is I, that's often how I feel. But then what we're talking about earlier is that many of our colleagues have, you know, died from this. And you feel yes. like it's almost a disservice for us to say how lucky we are because it, it is just luck and it's mm -hmm. not anything we did. And they were no. just unlucky. And it, that's the real sad, real sad thing is that, you know, and it's no one's fault. This is just the reality of, of what we've gone through. You know, yes. this is just a reality. What, what other, what, what else, what was the other solution? Just leave the patients alone in the room, you know, mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. th there was no other choice. Um, and I think, yeah, th I kind of, you know, people often say we don't know what, I think a lot of people have commented on my channel like, oh, you know, feel sorry for us because we didn't know what we're getting ourselves in for. But, you know, we, we kind of knew, you know, we kind of knew that we had this kind of, um, it was coming and we basically had mm. to, we had no, we had to step up. Um, there, yes. that, that was just the only way to do it. Well, and, and, the, and the thing about this uh, that people don't also realize that as much as that, as much as we know in modern medicine and modern science, right? We are, this is something that's novel to us. Um, and, and yes, we, we, there have been other versions of it, right? But this particular thing is something that's novel. And we are, people go, oh, the, well, this is all a conspiracy. Well, shit, no, we are literally walking around in a dark room with the blinds shut. There's no light in this room. We're trying to figure out what is going on. It's like, oh, okay, well, there's a wall there. I didn't know there was a wall there because I can't see it, but okay, now I know there's a wall here. Uh, okay, that's one thing I know, right? And you, you're gonna stumble around in this room with the blindfold on in the dark and oh shit I just stumble over the chair okay there's a chair there right and you kind of I, 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 to bring it back to video games it's like you're doing um one of these maze games you have no clue where you're going and you kind of you know stumble around okay now I have one frame of ref one point of reference you stumble around some more okay now I have two and we are gradually going to create this picture which is going to help us over time but each day it's yeah. like uh what, what am I gonna find yeah and it's a race against time isn't it you know we have to try and keep things try and learn as much as possible while you know because I think a lot of people I've said this in the vlog a few times people think that we're kind of like the front line, but I always describe ourselves as the last line, like the front line are kind of like the researchers or the people, you know, at home, they're making the biggest difference, you know, mm -hmm. by adhering to lockdown and the researchers trying to find that vaccine or trying to learn more about it. Really, yes. what we're doing is just stopping the very last <laughs> line. We are, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you don't want to end up in hospital with this, you know, every, all the real progress, you know, it does happen, you know, with people doing research, but these are, 
you know, often with positions as well, I'm not undermining that, but you know, that it is such a, a huge thing, like you say, trying to find, trying to shine a torch on that dark room, trying to get all the information we can. For sure. And, you know, somebody just commented that people don't like uncertainty. The, no, you're right. They don't. They, they want certainty, except that this is a thing where we, we can't provide certainty for you, right? Like it's this, we're trying to do research as quickly as we can, and we're trying to get the answers as quickly as we can. Um, but, you know, we, um, yeah, there is no certainty. It's like we, there are things that we think it, you know, it may be a tendency towards X, Y, or Z, but we don't know because we don't have the long-term studies. And so we kind of have to say, uh, okay, well, it looks like this and then run with it, right? Until we get a little more yeah. information and then it goes, oh, well, maybe it wasn't that. It was, it's a little bit more like this, you know? So anyway, so Ed, um, tell me, uh, last question, young man. Um, sure. people who, people who want to uh, find you, um, if this is the first time that they have met, uh, Dr. Ed Hope, where can they find you? Where can they find your content? Well, the best place just put in Dr. Hope onto YouTube. Uh, the channel is called sick notes, which was kind of my advertising brain, uh, trying to come up with something, but that was a big mistake calling that because, <laughs> because people, I've had people in my work call me as a nickname sick note now which sounds like i'm always off sick uh but yeah the channel's called dr hope sick notes we take a it's very much like yours we have a fun look at, at medicine you know reacting to certain uh, things i mean i do a very similar thing to you in terms of i do a kind of trauma diagnosis where i talk about uh injuries in fight scenes and movies that's been a, a thing i started last year um but yeah it's uh that's where you can find me Okay, excellent. So um, ha stay on Zoom and I'm just, I'll am just i just say goodbye to everybody here. So everybody who um, stuck around to uh, listen to our conversation, thank you very much for, for doing that. I know you guys are busy and I appreciate your attention and the time you spent. Um, as you said, Dr. Ed Hope, Sick Notes, you can find him on YouTube, you can find him on uh, Twitter and Instagram as well. And, and please go check out his stuff. I love it. And uh, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. I will see you guys on the next one. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris, as well, for having me. Not a problem, brother.